your career uh, touches on a, a philosophy and a theory that I've had for a long time that I've been thinking about, and I bring it up a lot on this uh, program, and I brought it a lot, brought it up a lot in different speeches I've given, which is this theory I have that it's your failure to be what you think you're supposed to be that often leads you to the thing you're really supposed to be. And I like that. no one demonstrates that better than you, Lars, because you come from this incredible tennis playing uh, family <laughs> and you're born in Denmark and that's the plan. And you're, you know, you're, you're playing tennis and you're working your way up through the system. And then you end up, uh, you come to the States to play tennis and it isn't quite working out for you. You're, it's not happening. And the next thing you know, you come to Newport Beach and it really doesn't happen. And you decide, all right, since I was like nine or 10, I've been obsessed with this kind of music that I've been hearing. Yep. Yeah. And uh, it is, we'd call it new wave British heavy new metal. New wave of British heavy metal was a specific thing that came out of the sort of the, you know, you know, Matt, right? It, sure. it came out of the, the sort of the, the later hard rock. It, it, it you know, the thirty-second version is that a lot of the big bands, you know, whether it was you know Led Zeppelin or Deep Purple or the Yeses of the world or the Genesis of the world, all these bands, as they Pink Floyd, as they went on and on, there was a not necessarily my perception, but to a lot of people, they became larger than life and sort of lost touch with with you know yeah. the streets and where they, where they came right. from. And so the thirty-second version is punk kind of grew out of that mm -hmm. as a response to. I can learn how to play three chords and I want to be in a band. I don't have to write 20 minute epics and do yep, all that kind yep. of stuff. And so punk rock was sort of born as a, as a, as a contrary musical force to rebellion. That. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then the new wave of British heavy metal sort of came out. That was the hard rock version of the punk movement with, you know, all the bands were doing it themselves, putting out their own EPs and singles and their own tapes and playing all the local clubs and kind of, you know, bringing it up themselves, punk rock styles. And the bands that came out of that were Iron Maiden, Def Leppard, Saxon, uh, Tigers of Pantang, Angel Diamond Witch, Head. I, Diamond, Diamond Head. Head. Yeah, I, I, I think you know all of them. And that was, I mean, I grew up in Denmark, in, uh, like you're saying, in, in, and started listening to the Deep Purples and the Black Sabbaths of the world in, in the mid 70s. Also listened to a lot of the stuff that was coming over, the more popular stuff coming over from England, like the Sweet and Slade and mm -hmm. Status Quo, and you know, then later Thin Lizzy, et cetera, et cetera. But when I got introduced to all the Iron Maidens of the world, uh, that really moved because again, there was that underlying relation to it, which is, I can do that. I never, I never sat there and listened to Deep Purple. You know, they were my favorite band, at, yeah. at, you know, but I never felt like I could do that. I right. never felt like I could do Black Sabbath. I never felt like I could do Thin Lizzy. But when I started hearing Diamond Head and the Tigers of Pantang and two degree bands like Iron Maiden and so on, it's like, I can do that. Right. And so when I came to, I spent a, a year at Nick Bolotari's Tennis Academy in Florida. Sarato Sarasota, yeah. Bradenton, the first year. And ran screaming out of there back to Denmark. And then um, <laughs> we ended up then in Newport Beach. I was going to go to uh, Coronel Del Mar High School, at, which was one of the highest ranked tennis uh, high schools in, in, in the country. And uh, six months later in February, as the tryouts were for the tennis team, uh, I was ranked in the top 10 in my age groups in Denmark. I didn't make the, I wasn't one of the seven best tennis players going to Corona Del Mar High School. I didn't make the fucking tennis team. <laughs> wow. So that, that's sort when of, you knew. That, that sort of, what are my other yeah, options? That yeah. just screwed up my Friday afternoon plans. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I, uh, I went back to, uh, back to the house and, and dove deeper into my uh, diamond head and my Iron Maiden records. And, um, you know, got a drum kit together and, and said, you know what, let's try this rock and roll thing and then place the ad in the recycler. So this is the thing. You place it, an ad in the recycler saying, this is specifically the kind of music I want to play. The only thing is that no one in the States at that time yes. really knows that music. You oh. are unusual because you're this agent that's come over from Europe. You're familiar with it, but you're, you alone sort of know about this. You put yeah. this ad in the, and then... At the same time, this guy also puts an ad, says he's looking for a drummer that plays a similar kind of music, a yeah. little different because he yeah. also mentions Aerosmith in his ad, but it's yeah. James Hetfield. Yeah. 
it's, and you two yeah. answer each other's yeah. ad. Yeah. Yeah. The, the That's key, crazy. Yeah, 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 the key word, you, you said the word alone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> even when I think back to that time, it was a very lonely time. You know, I would walk into Coronel Del Mar High School and listen, I was a an average student. I wasn't like a complete misfit or a fuck up or whatever, but I was a loner. Mm -hmm. I was an average student and I would walk in with my Iron Maiden t-shirts and my Saxon t-shirts and they would all sort of look at me. They weren't like bullying me. They weren't, there was nothing like weird, weird, but I was just a loner and an outcast. And, you know, if you talk to heavy metal, if you talk to others about heavy metal at the time, you know, it was, oh, you know, Kansas or Ario Speedwagon or Styx yeah, or yeah. Van Halen or whatever, no disrespect to any of them, but the stuff that we were, that were, that was turning us on and inspiring us was quite a bit edgier than that. Yeah. And so when James and I connected, I got a chance to play him a lot of the, you know, this music, these singles. He, like you said, came a little bit more from, from the Aerosmith and, and, you know, maybe Ted Nugent, Leonard Skinner, and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, but it was big in America at the time. But instant, he had heard of Iron Maiden. He, he knew Judas Priest and the Scorpions. And when we put our collective music, collect, you know, music uh, libraries together, it it gelled really quickly, and off we went. It's so cool that um, I mean, to me, I love. First of all, it's improbable. It's highly improbable, but it happens. If someone wrote that in a movie script, you'd say that that's a little too. <laughs> That, that wouldn't really happen. But no, it did. And then you have something that is very genuine and honest, something you're both very passionate about, and you get your band together. And I think one of the things that is the most impressive is you stick to your guns. And you've stuck to your guns. You know, Now, of course, anyone can armchair quarterback and say, that's it. Of course, Metallica is going to be massive. But that would not be have been anyone's call back then because, you know, no, it's... I mean, at, at that time, the music business was very formulaic. Mm -hmm. And so it was, this is how you're supposed to do it. And you, you get a, you know, you get signed to a record company, you get a chunk of money, then you go make a record on their terms, mm -hmm. their, by, by, by their formula and their directive. And then they promote you how they want to promote you and blah, 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 blah. And of course we weren't, interested in that. We weren't buying into that. We didn't think that any of that would be a, a, a possibility. So we just started doing our own thing, making, you know, some tapes, sending them to people in Europe. Uh, and very slowly, we started realizing that were that there were way more like-minded people and uh, music fans like ourselves who didn't want their music coming out of that mainstream formula that the record company mm -hmm. sort of provided. It, it's, I've said it before, it's the same thing as if you go into a restaurant and they give you a menu and they say, what would you like? But it's still limited to what's on the menu. And so we realized that a lot of music fans wanted something that wasn't on the menu at the time, which mm -hmm. wanted their rock way edgier and with a different sort of aesthetic and, and, and language and culture attached to it. And slowly as we started making records and playing all over Europe and playing all over America, that number grew to, to a point where we all sort of became the mainstream. Yeah. And that, you know, talk about mind fucks. That was this crazy mind fuck that nobody could predict was going to happen. Right, right. That the main, it wasn't that all the bands that were edgy moved towards the mainstream. It was that the mainstream moved out towards where all the edgy bands were. And 10 or 20 years later, all this crazy stuff that everybody was doing became the mainstream. And that, I still sort of struggle a little bit with that in, in all seriousness. You know, I still have a hard time. I'm permanently always feel like we're outsiders because that's how we grew up. Yeah. So with all these great, uh, things that are happening, it all still feels either momentary or, you know, somebody's going to, okay, uh, now make room for the real guys that are going to come in and do this of properly course. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And so there's a little bit of, of like, holy shit, it, we still don't really feel like we belong yeah, no matter how successful uh, we are. I, you know, the imposter syndrome is, is quite common. It's funny because recently I g got to speak to Billie Eilish and Phineas and, She's gone from very quickly being this very, both of them, these people with a very unique uh, take, just living in their parents' house, 
doing something and dressing the way they dress, and then suddenly the whole culture shifted and said, yeah. "Now you're, uh, you're it. You are the standard, <laughs> and um, you know we're going to look at how you dress, and we're going to decide how we should dress." And they're still adjusting to it. Like, yeah, what the fuck no, is that it's all crazy. about? No. And it's it's yeah. really yeah. it's a very strange phenomenon. Yeah. And it's also it 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 makes me think that it's not obviously limited to just music. You know, c coming from your world, watching, you know, the first time we saw Kinnison right. or the first time we saw Bobcat or yeah, the first yeah. time we saw, you know, some of these guys that were coming up and doing this crazy edgy shit that just wasn't part of the mainstream of comedy. And then right. five years later, Kinnison's like the biggest comedian in America oh, where, yeah. you know, all these guys are becoming mainstream or even the generation that you were just with in Washington last week yeah, or whatever, yeah. you know. Who would have thought that this would be the mainstream, you know, so, it, and it's kind of, you know, guess if, if you go into the, the, the film world, you know, with a lot of the edgy, you know, directors and, and all those projects and, you know, in Hollywood and the set, you know, that became the mainstream. It, it's kind of crazy how these cultural no, shifts yes, happen. Yes, the idea that Scorsese became <laughs> the, the, you know, the sort of benchmark Exactly. If you're thinking about, wait a minute, you mean the director of Mean Streets, who, exactly. who probably can't get most of his yeah. phone calls or returned? Tarantino? Or Tarantino for, for the same thing. Yeah, the guy who made made Reservoir Dogs is the number one director in Hollywood now. Yeah. I mean, you know, that is so cool that these types of things can happen, and it it kind of it kind of keeps shifting the zeitgeist of 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 the culture. Uh, in these, uh, in these, uh, you know, movements or or you know, time. Time periods, it's really cool.